and welcome to the front page from the Racing Post. I'm your host today, Racing Post editor Tom Kerr, and I'm thrilled to be joined in the studio by three of our very finest to discuss all the big stories coming out of a fascinating derby weekend. Uh, to my immediate left, I have uh, West Country correspondent James Stevens, uh, writer, broadcaster, columnist, tipster Matty Playo in the middle, and at the far end, deputy industry editor Peter Scargill, who was on the ground at Epsom on Saturday chasing around after the phantoms of Animal Rising. And that's where we're going to start today, because they promised to do what neither the pandemic nor World War II could do and cancel the derby. They swore that they would at least delay the race. And they said that their one red line was they would not go on the track during the race. Well, Animal Rising broke all of those promises because they failed to cancel the race, they failed to delay the race, and the one person who got on the track did so during the race. Peter, you were on the hunt on Saturday, as it were. What was the experience on the ground? It was um, an interesting experience, shall we say. Um, obviously, there's been all the build up, all the sabre rattling, all the threats, a thousand people. Uh, we're going to come across the hill with their pink t-shirts on uh, and delay the race. Obviously, we saw at Aintree, um, you know, people literally throwing themselves at the fence. Um, some people got onto the course and got onto the fence. So there was, you know, there was a precedent for what might happen. Mm. Um, and there was, you know, the build up to the race and, like you say, quite um, avert threats. I mean, you know, such avert threats, the jockey club were able to get their injunction because they were able to go to the high court and say, look, guys, <laughs> these people are saying they're going to do this. They've said it repeatedly. So, you know, it was, it was not a, uh, an insignificant day in that sense. But like, nobody turned up. Nobody turned up for various reasons, whether it was apathy, whether it's because of what the police did, whether it's because the Derby's not the Grand National. Um, but in the end, it was um, a very disappointing day if you were an Animal Rising supporter. We did, we should say, that the policing effort was, was clearly very successful because they arrested a number of activists in the hours preceding the race. And in addition to the one individual who did get on the track, I think there was a small number of other individuals who were prevented from doing so before they got on. But clearly, the thousands of protesters, or hundreds of protesters which were which were promised did not materialize um, you know first and foremost we, we, a lot of credit has to go though to the jockey club and Surrey police because we spoke a lot about how difficult it is to defend Epsom with all that open ground and they successfully managed it I think far more successfully than anyone outside and fr frankly a lot of people inside the jockey club expected yeah I mean they were ready they were ready if they underestimated potentially what Animal Rising might do at Aintree and I think maybe we all did mm. because you know there was a bunch of people who turned up from nowhere who were saying things and you know maybe we wrote them off as being extremists and crazy which they sort of are but you know in terms of preparation this time around you know there was fencing everywhere I have never seen so many fluorescent jackets mm. as they were I mean everywhere all the way down the straight on both sides it didn't impact it if you were viewing um, albeit there wasn't that many people there as it turned out in terms of spectators um, and they were ready like they were pumped up those security guards um, and the people in charge and the police and the jockey club it was like a big day for them and you know sort of off the record it was like bring it on lads you know yeah. if, you th if you think you can get through us like this then fair play but you know we've, we've nailed you overnight we've, we've arrested key people we've taken away your communications advice um, devices sorry um, and maybe, no, maybe they weren't quite as sort of um, adept to this stuff as we thought they were. They, you know, we, we sort of built them up in our minds into sort of a, the, the beta Meinhof gang. In fact, they were probably more just a bunch of people who have never done anything like this before and don't really have a lot of experience causing civil disruption. I mean, it comes across that way. It comes across, I mean, they obviously have evolved or not rebranded, probably a better way, out of Animal Rebellion, which mm. is a, an offshoot of Extinction Rebellion. You'll remember all of the... Um, Occupy protests that were going on. I mean, the biggest fear, sort of on on Saturday, was that Just Stop Oil might turn up because mm. Just Stop Oil, who you know were at the Crucible and they stopped the England cricket team the other day, and they've gone into the um, courts at tennis. So they don't tell you what they're doing, and they're very efficient in terms of getting on there. It seems that Animal Rising is seen a little bit as a joke in terms of disrupting, based on what happened. Mm. Um, in terms of the disruptors, the people who are out the front, perfectly lovely. Yeah. Perfectly lovely, friendly people dancing away, having a great time, odd views, 
Um, but you know, they, they're not going to cause any trouble, really. And Maddy, we, we saw afterwards, they did get one person on the track, and then following that incident, the Animal Rising Twitter account put out a tweet in which they said, uh, the <coughs> jockey club has endangered uh, the, the, the horses and, and the lives of those involved in the race by starting the race when uh, a protest is on the track, even though in the background of their own video, there was a big screen that quite clearly showed the race had been off and running for several furlongs. I mean, in terms of sort of mendaciousness, that was extraordinary. Yeah, and you mentioned at the, at the top of the show about that sort of red line that they said they weren't going to cross and, and they've just evidently crossed it and then thought that they'd got away with telling this lie, essentially. Um, and I think ultimately, as Peter sort of said, uh, it just totally uh, takes an axe to their credibility or any mm. credibility that they had. Um, you know, we're hearing them come out now with much more extreme views, which I think naturally the public are going to find harder to relate to. Um, and yeah, this was not a successful weekend if you were an Animal Rising uh, follower or fan. I spoke to Ed Chamberlain, uh, who was presenting for ITV across the Friday and the Saturday, and he sort of said he was very anxious, actually, um, yeah. and had security guards sort of protecting him, but also praised um, the jockey club and everyone involved for their collaboration and really coming together. And I think we saw that um, in how successfully, um, largely, this sort of operation was mm. as a whole. Um, I wonder, did you speak to any of the, the protesters? Do you sense that they're going to try this at any other events? I mean, we saw there was a climate-related uh, incident at Ascot last year, wasn't mm. there? Do you think we're going to... Mm, before last 21. Yeah, we're going to get we're going to get some more of this, do you think? I don't. I mean, I, I spoke with the friendly protesters, the peaceful protesters, um, and, you know, they, they have... There's this sort of narrative that's developed that, you know, we're going to end thoroughbred racing and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, it's, it's basically being used as a vessel to get to their main main message, which is they want to sort out food production and what have you. And I think they probably saw racing as an easy target. It gets a lot of press coverage, um, television channels, major, and they probably thought, Do you know what, we'll go into this, um, we'll disrupt it, we'll um, we'll get a lot of coverage for it, and then we can get our main agenda on. And, I, and racing's basically not been the pushover that it thought it was going mm. to be. Um, the friendly protesters, they might protest other meetings. Uh, I suspect they won't be afforded the opportunities the Jockey Club gave them in terms of a, of a friendly space that was, you know, sorted out over the Donut Summit in um, in London last month. Um, but it's, I don't know, getting into Royal Ascot. I mean, that was Extinction Rebellion under the guys. They were catering stuff, yeah. weren't they? Yeah. Mm. Um, so they'll be wise to that. Getting into Ascot's more tricky. Um, a lot more security. It's not more security. Well. You know, you've got the royals, and then you know, talk about Goodwood. But I mean, is anyone, is anyone really going down to Goodwood protest? I mean, the Grand National was their was their moment, and they they sort yeah. of took it, and they've almost they almost overplayed their hands to some extent. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's they're just I don't know. I mean, they've got you know Ben Newman, the guy that got on the course. He's in in court today. They might get some coverage out of that, but I, you know, I, I suspect they'll go well, off and they'll keep just, just pouring finally, milk on the floor just and stuff on like this, that. On the, on the getting coverage, right? you know, because this is this is an important point because this is sort of the, you know, the most high-profile sort of challenge to racing that's taken place in the sort of public sphere, you know, in a, in a long time basically. But their sort of worldview, you, you talked about food production, mm. but it's not really just food production. It's any involvement between. Anim animals and humans, so... Domestic pets. Domestic pets, mm -hmm. exactly. They do not believe people should have cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. So it's not just sort of saying we don't think there should be dairy farming or we don't think there should be animal sports. They don't think there should be any relationship between sure. humans and animals, which is, you know, it's an extraordinarily extreme view. And they sort of get compared with Just uh, Stop Oil, you know, but Just Stop Oil's views in many respects are actually far more mainstream far mm -hmm. more mainstream in terms of, you know, so suggesting there's a climate uh, catastrophe that needs to be tackled than animal risings. So, you know, their views being given a platform, I think has actually been to their detriment because mm. people have sort of looked at this initially, thought, oh, they're, they're, they're taking an issue with uh, horse racing, but in fact, they've now realized it's a far, far more uh, extreme sort of worldview than that.
Yeah, I think one of the other sort of key key elements to what happened on 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 the weekend is that in the build up to the derby, we saw a lot of coverage about what they were going to do, what they were going to do, and how much of a big threat they they were going to be to disrupting the race. And the fact they didn't do it, I think, will probably make those sort of news editors, those big TV companies, just think twice and just be a little bit more cautious about how much sort of coverage to give them. And I, th and I think from a public perspective, which in theory is, is who they're trying to convince and they're, who they're trying to send their message to, it looked reckless, it looked dangerous, and I think if that is their approach to trying to convince people to that way of thinking, mm. I'm not sure it's going to work. Yeah. Just one final thing. I think this is kind of almost informative for racing because they might not no longer be the sort of... Uh, creditable opposition animal rising but we've sort of had a trial run of how best racing can defend itself both in person when it comes to policing I mean Aintree are surely going to learn lessons from Epsom uh, and also you know fans of racing and racing in the media and stand up to racing how, how we defend our sport that way so in a way we can play down animal rising and, and say they might not be all that potent and powerful a force but you know, we still need to take seriously anyone who is coming out and opposing racing, and, and it could almost be helpful. Yeah, I agree. I think it's giving racing an opportunity to think about how it presents itself publicly. It's a very good point. Uh, before we move on to our second story, a very quick uh, commercial notice, because we are running a fantastic competition uh, for you to win a trip to the Breeders' Cup at stunning Santa Anita. All you have to do is place a bet on our app, uh, watch this video to find out more. Welcome back. Uh, on to our second story, and we're sticking with Epsom, and we're going to talk about what uh, we're dubbing the debacle on the downs. In the dash, where four of the 20 runners were released from the stalls, uh, fractionally after the rest, it's the world's fastest race, and yet the stewards took no action at all. James, um, what do we think about this? It, you know, it, on the surface, it looks absolutely ridiculous that they claim that there was no impact at all because you only have to look at where the affected horses finished and their starting prices to, to sort of ascertain that clearly they all dramatically underperformed. Yeah, I think just to sort of go back to, to what happened for those that might not have seen, I mean, it's said to be the fastest race in the world, as you say, but it's, it's very difficult to do when the stalls aren't open. Mm. So. We saw that the uh, four of the five widest stools, um, slow motion shots will indicate that those stools did not open simultaneously with the, other, with the other stools, which of course opens up a huge question mark as to um, what should have happened with the race. Now, the, there are a number of options. Uh, the race could have been voided, mm. which means essentially just, just agree that it was a, not fair. And under some BHA regulations, if the, there is a, a, an impact from the stools or there's a failure from the stools, that will take place. But in this situation, um, the BHA came out and said that they did not feel that the, the runners were materially impacted, is what they said on the stewards report, um, compared to the rest of the field. So that the slow motion shots prove that well, the stalls did open, it was only a fraction and it didn't really affect them, which is quite an interesting it, it, it's, point it's, it's, of it's view. It's this sort of stewarding philosophy that basically unless the margin yeah. of victory or defeat was so small that you think it could have been mm. overcome, then there's no impact. But which is, is absolutely ridiculous because if someone, if someone has, a, has a run stopped, then the impact is going to be more than a nose, isn't it? Yeah, well, well, I mean, look, there were different things that could have happened. They could have said those horses were non-runners, and, and we've had David Evans speak in, in the newspaper today, who um, trained Lee, Lee Hu, um, called the race a farce, said that his cost should be reimbursed because he didn't get a run mm. for his money, which is fair. I mean, my perspective is, is that if the stalls don't open on time, it's sort of black and white. They either do or they don't. And, and how much you can decide, OK, well, that didn't have an impact, but that did. I think that's, that's a little bit dangerous of a sort of place to be looking at from a sport. I think, in my own honest opinion, I just, just, 
look at it and go, well, if they opened on time, they didn't. If they did, they didn't. And I mean, the other interesting element to all of this is that the world pool, it was one of the biggest days for the world pool. So you've got countries that are betting on British rating that mm. otherwise wouldn't be looking at it. So there's those sort of implications as well. I mean, yeah, look, the horses were sent, were sent off, including the 6 to one favourite live in the moment. They finished 14th, 15th, 17th and 20th. You cannot say that, that they didn't perform to strength because they clearly didn't. I mean, one of them on the, the basis of sort of um, expectations would have run in the top 10 at the very least. So, yeah, an interesting situation. Um, and the final point um, I'll make is from um, the Horse Race Betters Forum, who are essentially a, a voice of the punter. Um, they felt the race should have been null and void and stakes refunded. So mm. it has implications on punters too. What do we think, Matty? Do, uh, I, th I kind of feel void would have been a little bit extreme, but surely these, these have to be non-runners. They've not got a fair run. Yeah, I'd probably be inclined to agree with that. For me, uh, the thing I had an issue with is just the, the wording of the stewards' report. Um, they said that they tested the stalls as per their procedure beforehand and everything was smooth, um, but that uh, several horses uh, an anticipated the start broke open the gates shortly before the start was affected. Well, how can you then go on to say... Uh, on balance, uh, none of those runners' chances were materially impacted. Well, you're saying horses have physically forced the gates open. So the fact that that is OK in this instance, do we need to then go back and look at how the stores are actually working on a day-to-day -day basis then? If, it, if, if it's you know, absolutely fine for horses to break their way through um, causing you know, a result like this, what does that mean in every other case? Uh, mm. So I thought the wording of the stewards' report was, was contradictory insufficient, pretty poor. Um, and regards to voiding the race or not, I can understand why they didn't take the decision to, to void the whole race. But for me, in this scenario, you want, uh, where there's confusion and conjuncture, you want uh, clarity and you want confidence and you want lots of, uh, you know, you want to be able to understand how the decisions were reached. And in, in this case, I really don't think that's what's happened. Yeah, Pete, um, where we wanted clarity, it feels a bit more like we got complacency. Yeah, and, and um, I don't know, there's, there's many facts. I mean, if I was Animal Rising, I'd have said that we affected the start of this race and we caused the carnage because that got more attention than what they did. <laughs> it would have, been a, would have been a PR win for them. Um, it's, it's the dash and the derby confused. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, we were yeah. there. We, we told the horse to accelerate out the gate beforehand. Um, I mean, looking at the rules... It, they were saying that they could void the race if it was a third of the field affected by the stores. I don't, and it was this materially affected line. I don't know whether because it was a quarter, it was deemed, you know, it was below the threshold. Therefore, that was um, fine. And there's also this this well pool element. You know, there are there are issues in terms of different rules in different countries. And this would different... never happen in Hong Kong, though, would it? Well, I mean, I, what in terms of the stores would fail, or in yeah. terms of the fast afterwards? I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's been there's been issues with with um, the stores in the World Pool before. I think of Royal Ascot, um, back to Sylvester the Souza horse, which um, good old horse name I can't remember, um, and Harry Angel slightly before the World Pool. So, so I mean, there have been issues with the stores and the problems it's caused. So is this an incident where they've gone well? We can kind of get through it without voiding it. Keeps the World Pool going. Mm. You, you know, you, I, I, I don't know whether it's that extreme, but there are many elements involved in this, aren't Ultimately, there? The losers, the losers are the connections and anyone who bet on those four horses because you can be absolutely certain that what happened meant you had no chance whatsoever, basically. Well, well I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you need... You need good track position in that race yeah. because it's hard to make up ground, or but you, you see some flying late. These horses were were fancied, um, and it just yeah, y your run was gone. Yeah, and look, we all <laughs> all of us involved in races go to the race with expectation, and sometimes it doesn't work out. But you don't kind of expect it to work out because of the stalls. Um, I don't know if I was the jockey club, perhaps I'd be inclined to give these guys a call up and say, look. I'm sorry it didn't work out for you. Perhaps uh, we can make some kind of amends. A gesture, yeah. perhaps. Mm. Um, I think, well, they need to do that for all the thousands of punters, though, as well, which uh, I suppose... Oh, I haven't considered that. Yes. That's why I'm not in charge of racing. Too, mi too micro. Give it time. Give it time. Um, <laughs> we're going to move on to the third story because uh, another of the many, many fascinating angles coming out of Epsom Maddy was Frankie the Tory, uh, who is 
riding out of his skin this season. The punters love him. He's loving life. And he had an Oaks Day double, uh, which uh, it was it included the Oaks itself and Tall Sister. Uh, everyone's asking now, almost predictably, is, if, is, he, is he going to retire? Is he going to walk away from, from this when he's at the top of his game? Yeah, this is something that um, our colleague Lewis Porteous wrote about recently as well, that he sort of wouldn't blame him for taking a U-turn on that. And the more I think about it, the more I'm, I'm thinking the same. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating uh, story, this, because, of course, we have the, the sub text of last year and um, the the John Gosden sabbatical um, that was uh, so Frankie Dottori perhaps you know forced by that you know maybe thought okay perhaps my time has come and, and this is the time to wind it down uh, he's very much a confidence rider and, and you saw that with the the uh, ride to give uh, Emily up John and soul sister you know from the back of the field yes he had plenty of horse under him but wasn't afraid to go the wider route and, and just delivered them beautifully and also Prosperous Voyage and mm. several others that we've seen this season, you know, Little Big Bear, etc. for Aidan O'Brien at Haydock. Um, went to Santa Anita, was riding out a lot. Uh, he said sort of nine rides a day. So that would have helped him reach full fitness. It would have helped his confidence. You know, it's a nice climate. He clearly gets along very well with how things run over there. And since he's come back, he's just been in electric form. He's not riding very often. He's picking and choosing his big days, as he always has done, but perhaps to an even more severe degree. Um, and his relationship with John Gosden seems pretty solid. So mm. he said on Look On Sunday uh, yesterday that he still plans to retire on October 21st and that four months is a long time in racing. So do you take that as... Four months is plenty of time for me to lose this illustrious streak or four months is plenty of time for me to change my mind and see what develops. Um, so now I guess the questions are, what is it going to take for him to stay? Is he going to want a champion two-year-old that he can take into his three-year-old season? Is he going to want a derby contender? Is he going to want one of the star older horses to stay in training next year? And is there any way that he could change his mind? Um, he has done before and we've seen similar jockeys Jamie Spencer, etc., retire, Hayley Turner, come back. Um, and I think there's an argument to be said that we're, we're witnessing peak to Tory at the moment. He's mm. using all his experience, all that confidence um, to deliver on track. Fans are loving it. He's loving it. Uh, he is, is this he is, be the though. End? He is, 52. Um, is, is it not the argument that, you know, he's decided he's going to go out, he's riding out of his skin, what better time to hang up your yeah. boots? Because the flip side is if you don't hang, retire when you're at your best, you're going to retire when you're not at your best, which is sort of a sad denouement to an un un otherwise unbelievable career. So there's a danger in hanging around, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, if I was Frankie personally, I think I would stick to the plan. Because yeah. also it's slightly embarrassing having to make that U-turn, even if you are as popular as Frankie There's a lot is. of retirement events. There's, <laughs> there's, a, yeah. there's a big retirement dinner it's on Champions Day. And yeah. stuff, so it'd be slightly embarrassing going to everyone like, actually... Same do time again <laughs> next year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, he's, he's image conscious as well, Frankie, isn't he? Let's be frank. He's a guy that wants to be seen doing his flying dismounts, whatever yeah, he might say yeah. it does to his ankles. He wants to be loved. He wants to be seen mm. kissing the turf at Epsom and everyone. You know, when he went through that period after he lost the Godolphin job and he came back and he was in the in the doldrums, I mean, that wasn't that wasn't what he wanted to do. And perhaps that's impacted him as well, because then he found he had Elshie Cab and he found Golden Horn and mm. this relationship with Gosden and he's kicked on. I mean, because you, you either retire or you get retired, don't you? Yeah. Mm. So if he can go out and he's riding over and everyone goes, oh, Frankie, please stay. Please for his stay. Legacy, and it? then he goes, yeah. oh, guys, I can't. I've said I'm going to retire. And then he can go off and he can go and do a media career and I don't know, whatever the things you do. And everyone says, oh, Frankie, you should still be riding. Oh, guys. Yeah. I had to retire, guys. I said it was. It's a great way to do, go do, out. Do, do you know what great I mean? Way to go out when everyone is clamoring rather, for you to stay. Yeah, yeah. rather than. Oh, hang on, I haven't really got a horse for the Kentucky yeah. Derby or oh, I'm going to ride a 66 to one shot in the Derby. Oh, I really wish I'd yeah. retired yeah. last year. I, I suspect how it looks is probably is driving it as much as um, yeah. what's going on. I think uh, you made a very good point, Maddie, that the one thing that, that would genuinely, genuinely cause him to, to really struggle with that is if he got 
an amazing horse, a sort of another mm. enable or something. If someone, a horse came along that was going to take him to that sort of level, it would be hard for him to, to walk away because he'd be walking away from, 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 from that story with that horse. I think, it, yeah, and as Pete said, it's, it's public facing and this is about his legacy, etc. And Enable was unique because it wasn't necessarily her ability, as fantastic as she was, it was her relationship with the public. And he was had a very unique connection with her compared to other great horses that he's ridden. So for a horse to forge that sort of relationship with him and the public, I think, is, is going to be a big ask. Um, but who's to say it can't happen? Because he is scooping everything before him at the moment anyway. It's amazing. Uh, just before we go on to our final story today, uh, a quick advert for Racing Post Members Club Ultimate, uh, which is our top tier subscription service, gets you access to all the fantastic journalism uh, from the Racing Post top uh, journalists and access to lots of tools, replays, etc. on the Racing Post website as well. Watch the video, please. <laughs> Welcome back, and for our final story, we are doing uh, the reverse of From the Sublime to the Ridiculous, and having begun with Animal Rising, we are going to finish with the master himself, Aidan O'Brien, who masterminded what has been described as one of the training performances of the century, bringing back Auguste Rodin from a 22 length stuffing in the 2000 guineas to a brilliant uh, derby win on Saturday. Uh, James, where do we rank this one in the stratosphere of O'Brien's remarkable achievements? Well, for me, I would say it's the best one I can remember. I think that he talks a lot about how things went wrong at Newmarket and just, just the, the getting there was, was a problem because of the sort of security needed because of the coronation. But the horse was, was just a completely different horse to what we mm. saw at Epsom. And I, and I think the transition within pretty much a month is just extraordinary. Um, yeah, uh, uh, to do that is very special and credit to all of his team. I mean, I have done some digging about how good the performance was compared to the others. And he improved his racing post rating 68 pounds. But being Aidan O'Brien, he's actually done that better than that twice before. So um, Power in 2012 was 17th in the 2000 guineas won the Irish 2000 guineas and was 82 pounds better. Wow. And uh, Roderick O'Connor the year before was 72 pounds better. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised for Aidan O'Brien. Um, yeah. Extraordinary trainer and, and yeah, the Derby one looks very good. I mean, I've got the chance to say, would I back him in the arc? No, because I think we saw the winner at Epsom in Emily Upjohn, who was seriously impressive. Seriously Loved the impressive, acceleration she yeah. showed. So yeah, great racing on the whole, but my, my, never discount Aidan O'Brien. It is amazing because in the run-up to the race, I think everyone was sort of saying, you know, how is August Rodin favourite? Uh, he ran like a block of wood at uh, Newmarket. Uh, Aidan O'Brien, of course, was telling everyone who would listen, this horse is something incredibly special. Um, but, but how many people actually, actually believed that, Maddie? I mean, enough for the, him to remain prominent in the market, clearly, but publicly, there's a lot of skepticism. Yeah, and I'll, I'll volunteer myself. I was one of those of thinking this is a huge task. Um, but Aina ran all the way through. That's been the theme of the build up to this year's Derby, if it wasn't Animal Rising, was that he had so much confidence behind Auguste Rodin um, and he could pinpoint where things went wrong. You know, it wasn't mm. an inexplicable, dismal effort in the Guineas. They, as James pointed out, they had the travel, they had the uh, imp peeding um, of him a little big bear in the race. Um, but still, he had to answer several questions here. You know, a son of Deep Impact, he is totally, totally unique. Um, that's why I had Saxon Warrior in this race, and he, of course, didn't really get the trip. Um, but he took the four furlongs in his stride and, and looks a real powerhouse. For me, at, at one of the best things about this performance, I thought was, uh, A, I thought he was given a brilliant ride by Ryan Moore. Mm. Um, 
when King of Steel got out, Kevin Stott was very adamant that you know he was going straight away. Whereas Ryan Moore, you sense he was just holding on a little bit more and timing his run um, to perfection. And that's nothing against Kevin Stott because I don't think you know he he could have won the race anyway. But also how well balanced this horse was in the final stages. You know, at Epsom we saw it with Soul Sister in the Oaks. She lent into the camber and ended up more or less along the rail and we often see horses wandering around a little bit because it is a challenging terrain straight as you could like uh, he's very athletic um, he's a beautiful mover and i'm really excited to see what he can do next and a word for king of steel as well pete because uh, roger varian um you know probably deserves a, a similar sort of level of credit to aiden o'brien because in the in the lead up to the race he sort of said i think king of steel is actually uh, going to massively outrun his odds and sure enough he ran an absolute storming race. Kevin Stock gave him a great ride even though he was quite critical of himself afterwards. Um, that's a serious performance right there. Yes, it's, it's a sort of eye-rolling sometimes isn't it when people train outsiders for big races. Yeah. Perhaps for prominent owners who you think maybe are exerting some pressure on them to only go, <laughs> yeah, okay, fine, you said it's going to run Old well. cynic Pete. Um, <laughs> but he, I mean, he is a gargantuan was a big huge impressive horse and the way he went around Epsom was very impressive with that regards the horse obviously had been due to run at the Dante had to go all the way up to York got upset in the stalls so had to overcome that now fair play to him he delivered it really well um, just got beaten by a better horse mm. better horse who I suspect relished the ground at Epsom um, as opposed to Newmarket I know yeah. he'd won on heavy ground at Doncaster Handicappers certainly weren't convinced by that run at Doncaster, so the ground probably helps. And I just thought it was interesting, when Aidan O'Brien was interviewed after the race, they were talking about future plans, and he talked about sort of being free from the shackles of the Triple Crown, because mm. he got beat in the Guineas, yeah, and now they could go to what well, they didn't have to go to the Ledger. I actually thought it was quite an interesting way of viewing it, this thing that we still hold, some of us, the idea of oh, maybe there'll be another Triple Crown when it wasn't unfortunate that um, Camelot didn't do it, but actually, sometimes the Trainers actually don't want to do it at all. And well, they'd rather go for I different think they races. Recognize, though, I mean, if you, if it's you not commercial, all, is it? If you, no. Yeah, if you take August Sudan, you know, they recognise that clearly a mile was too short and that a mile six in the ledger would be testing. But that's the beauty of, of the Triple Crown. And it's a shame, actually, that more trainers aren't sort of inclined to go and owners aren't inclined to go down that route because, you know, ultimately if they come up short, that's, that's disappointing. But it's only by undergoing these sort of tests that push the limits of these uh, these animals' uh, natural ability that you are going to uncover the true greats. And you know, sadly, we're not going to see a triple crown winner this year. But I love the fact that they they, they actually care about that. So if I'm a cynic, you're a romantic, are you? Yeah. This is it. <laughs> this is it. Um, just before we wrap up our Epsom discussions, uh, Maddie, any other sort of equine takeouts from it? We've mentioned Soul Sister. We've mentioned Emily Upjohn. They were obviously a couple of other. Uh, key stars. Yeah, a uh, couple of points. Just sticking with the derby for now. Uh, the, from a form perspective, I think it was a little bit of a sort of temper enthusiasm because a couple of the key players didn't really perform. Uh, Arrest blatantly didn't handle the ground or the track. Passenger faded uh, really dimly. Uh, there were some others in there who just didn't really seem to take to it. The Foxes ran very well, probably once. Uh, 10 furlongs again but mm. yeah I would have and you had the two break clear so that sort of makes you think mm, how well did did the rest deal with the challenge um elsewhere I wrote a piece in today's paper I was quite interested by what John Gosden had to say on Benoit de la Sayette after he won the race named after uh, Lester Piggott um sort of said he gave him uh, Torito a Lester Piggott-esque ride and I was sort of delving into whether or not Benoit could be the new Frankie de Tori mm -hmm. uh, is clearly going to be um, part of the future at Clare Haven, so it remains to be seen how he's going to step up. No claim now, of course, which is a, a big talking point, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see him in the winner's enclosure at Royal Ascot. Great, Maddie. And uh, just before we wrap up everything, guys, we've got a little bit of breaking news, actually, because uh, we are going to uh, be publishing on Racing Post uh, later this morning, as I speak, as we film, but earlier today as, as we release this. Uh, that Oliver Sherwood um, is bringing his uh, decorated training career uh, to a close. Uh, uh, James, um, just a word on Oliver's achievements. Yeah, an in incredible trainer who's sort of 
being one of those trainers that's been around for all the changes around jump racing, it's, it's a game then uh, that period of time that he's the game is completely transformed and he's always operated at a very high level. I mean, from a personal perspective, I absolutely loved Many Clouds. Mm, and I thought just yeah. that that's bringing him to to win a what was a Hennessy then I think possibly was Labrook's trophy, I don't know, but it, it is the Hennessy. Yeah. And then win a Grand National of a big, big weight was an, was an incredible... And then that devastating training. day at Cheltenham with Slittle Track. Yeah. Where, you I, know, an unbelievable performance with such a heartbreaking... Yeah, uh, it was. And, uh, and, I, and I think that, that he, for many people, is, is remembered for that sort of... that kind of very easy to understand story, isn't it? Just sort of the, the great high and then a really crippling low and his emotion and, and his honesty of, of dealing with something like that is something that I think a lot of people remember, especially sort of my age who were sort of, that was sort of the time they really got into betting and watching racing and, and seeing that sort of emotional connection was quite special. A great trainer, he's always been a pleasure to deal with and, and yeah, I mean, best of luck to him in his, his new venture. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very best of luck to Oliver. Uh, so it remains for me to decide what's going to go on the front page. Let me think. It's been Derby week. Uh, we're probably going to do the Derby winner. I would say that is the natural Racing Post front page. And so that brings us to a close this week. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you very much to my panellists in the studio. Uh, and we hope to see you again next week. Before we go, though, uh, we've got an advert for the Racing Post app, which you can use to get your fill of racing news, views, cards, and all the rest in the meantime. Thank you very much for joining us. See you next week. Yeah.